ஜோஹானஸ்ட்டன்பர்க் யூனிவர்சிட்டி இன் ஜெர்மனி and uh, he worked on secondary ice production earlier uh, with uh, um, prof, uh, w- w- in lund university and uh, he has finished his uh, msc in electronics and communication from gohati university assam and uh, i must tell you that uh, uh, currently he is uh, working on uh, experimental studies on retention of uh, um, secondary organic aerosols and its precursors and uh, the i must tell you that i was very impressed by his uh, um, the poster presentation at uh, iugg in berlin and uh, and uh, by talking to him i realized that uh, maybe his visit to iatm uh, would benefit us and uh, benefit him as well to have a link between uh between us and uh, also to do some collaborative works so um he has only told me he would like to visit iitm so i told maybe you share your uh, experiences he works uh, at a very um, unique laboratory i will uh, request him to explain uh, to us and we we are all very honored to have you here and um, please uh, we we all invite you to give your talk thank you it's all hindi mein kuch bol nahi saki it's working good morning everyone first of all uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk here especially thara ma'am and all the uh, people who have made it possible honestly i don't know how relevant or how well i can explain to you guys what i am doing but i'll try my best apologies in advance if i make any mistake so uh what i'll start with my current work and if time permits i'll also talk a bit about what i did in my previous work with the secondary rice production so here uh, i'm working in the wind tunnel laboratory in mines in uh, johannes gutenberg university and that is uh, one of a kind worldwide unique vertical wind tunnel that is still existing that is still working and in the laboratory they have done a lot of studies since 1980s and yes i have too many studies to be honest and i do not know all of them <laughs> and but right now i'm involved in this project that is funded by this uh, tp change program from dfg and it is a big collaborative project with uh, seven universities and also dlr flight campaign and we are also one of those universities where we do some experimental studies and also there is a group with modeling and another group that does a bit of uh, in situ aircraft measurements so let's start Uh, talking about aerosols first of all we all know aerosol i mean there are particles suspended in air and we've seen like with lot of pollution and everything there are, the amount of aerosol in the atmosphere has been increasing ever since now there are two types of aerosols firstly the ones that are directly emitted into the atmosphere for example from the industries from vehicles from uh forest canopies plants vocs and also from biomass bar- burning and also from sea spray there's sometimes sea or ocean spray those bubbles that pop up uh on and off in the ocean so those are called the primary organic aerosols and yeah the term organic is to signify that there is a carbon chain or carbon atom present in that aerosol and as i said there are different types of sources of these aerosols 
and also anthropogenic. And then we come to secondary organic aerosols. So the secondary aerosols are the ones that are derived from the, or they are like a oxidation product or uh, photochemical reaction of <coughs> those organic sorry, aerosols and they form another different products. Uh, the ones, the examples that I have shown here are the ones that we, uh, we have studied uh, in our lab. In our lab. Mostly alpha pinin uh, derivatives. Those are the. It is a monotherpene that is released from this forest canopy, and there are whole list of uh, um, whole a big list of products that are produced from this uh, primary aerosols. And then we also have some phenol derivatives that is mostly a biomass burning marker. So this is very. This phenol groups uh, are very prominent with uh, burning markers. So at least half of the global EOA are also chemically transferred to SOA. And also there have been studies that say that almost uh, 60 to 70 percent of the aerosol contained in the atmosphere is dominated by the secondary organic aerosols. Now here's a quick glimpse of some of the relevance of the aerosols. I am sure all of most of us know about it. So it affects the cloud condensation. It acts as a nuclei. It enhances more of increase in cloud condensation nuclei. Then it affects, uh, impacts the optical properties of the aerosol layer by increasing the thickness. It affects the radiative properties, the, both the short wave and the long wave. And then there is climate influence. We can see this picture, which is very common in. Uh, have highly populated countries like India, China, or in the South American subcontinent, this layer of aerosols, and it has been heavily stressed on in the in all in all of the IPCC reports. And then there are also health impacts because of the of the particulate matter that form, that uh, creates the breathing problems, skin problems, and whatnot. Then they also affect the ecosystem nutrient input, mostly those uh, algal bloom uh, in the oceans and lakes. They are also affected by the deposition of aerosols when they are scavenged, and they add to the uh, they make an imbalance of the nutrient content in the uh, ocean or water level. And then they have this precursor material for atmospheric process that is that that what we are studying, they act as precursor for different, for further oxidation and further more products. Okay, and then we have this very famous diagram that was published in IPCC AR4 in, yeah, in, yeah, work package one, just to show all of, most of this fact, there's this direct effect in impacting the, CCN number and increasing the liquid water content as they go up. And then also they have indirect effect, which increase, which changes the albedo uh, in many places. Also the cloud height and the lifetime of a cloud, it changes. And yeah, they also heating causes. And I would not go much in depth with this, just to give an overview of what we already know. So, the motivation of our study, uh, I have not given a reference to this picture because this was uh, from our proposal uh, diagram. Uh, so our main aim is to understand the transport mechanism of secondary aerosol species and what happens during that during their transport in a convective system. So when they are released, they get uplifted in the environment and those clouds they undergo freezing and we do, we do not really know because there have not been many in situ measurements we, to be to, to have precise knowledge about it. And also during the freezing process, they are in when they are in a cloud droplet form, they are in a, they are very water soluble, and so there could be possibility that they remain in the water molecule when when they are free, when they are frozen or they are expelled from the water molecule. So. We are we we are mostly studying the water soluble 
uh, volatile organic compounds or oxidation products. Then this is our main motivation, the transfer to UTLS, because after this, there is mostly like uh, stable atmospheric layer and there the loading is quite high in many modeling studies they have found that. And we want to help provide data with our experiments uh, to give a more better understanding of the retention of those secondary organic aerosols. As I say, as said already, so the species can be revolatized during rhyming or freezing. And just to explain this diagram here, so in this section, in the lower clouds formation or the warmer temperature uh, relative to the top, uh, here the growth is mostly from rhyming of particles when they are uplifted. And in the up, in the colder uh, section here, it is mostly heterogeneous. Homogeneous is not very much, but they are mostly heterogeneous and also rhyming. And then uh, we also want to study the chemical properties, how they are dependent on and what properties, uh, for example, their dependency on the pH or temperature and how they change the whole uh, retention process. So if, if there's a line in here, this thing. No, back. OK, so in this talk, I will mostly focus on some key words that I will be used on very often. The first word is retention. As I mentioned, uh, retention is basically how much of a substance, uh, substance is retained during its freezing process when it is uh, when it is in the updraft motion. And then to quantify that uh, retention, we have a retention coefficient, just a fraction, and it is basically the ratio of concentration in the supercool phase of the liquid drops to the uh, frozen uh, phase. And also to find the, uh, to have a good idea of different substances, we we relate this retention coefficient with the uh, Henry's law solubility constant. So what Henry's law states that basically at a given fixed temperature and pressure, the concentration of gas inside the solute is equal to is equal to the concentration of gas outside the solute. So uh, we refer to this term as H plus uh, H star as Henry, effective Henry's law, and we use this as an indicator for our retention coefficient measurements. And you can see here is a small schematic here, which I will be showing in detail in the coming slides. So there is a uh, water droplet and there is a solute inside. So the freezing initiation of freezing happens and then the solute particles, they can go aqueous reaction inside the water droplets. Then they have uh, interfacial mass transport. They have uh, aqueous diffusivity and then also gaseous uh, diffusivity to the outside the surface. And all of these factors, they they are needed to quantify this retention phenomenon. Here's a nice cartoon that was drawn by Miklos, my supervisor. So here is, for I'll say, this is the ground level here, and this is a convective system. And we say this is the zero level of the atmosphere, and here is almost the top, like, yeah of the uh, minus 40 degree. And then above that, we can say it's more or less stable. Uh, it's not very clear, but it is a stable atmospheric layer in here. To make it more simplified, in this section, we have water droplets. And in this section, there are most, all of it is, all of them are ice crystals. And the main, I, the main interesting part for us is the mixed phase where there are water and ice, where there is gradual freezing and sublimation and scavenging of those particles. And yeah, it's shown by this spiral thingy. So this arrow signifies the 
limit of our or the extent of our experimental study that we can do in our lab. So we can go up to minus 30, more or less, well, minus 25 to minus 30, and from minus 30 degrees centigrade up to warmer temperatures. So we can do study on those chemicals within this temperature range. Mm, yeah, so coming back to again, why on the substances that we are doing? So during deep, as I said, during the deep convection, when the clouds are up to, uh, uplifted, there could be scavenging, there could be re, uh, distribution of the whole aerosol layer across the troposphere. And the secondary aerosols, they are found to have uh, from uh, measurements from uh, field data and also uh, models done by Ms. Uh, Mary Parks is a very renowned scientist who is working with uh, aerosols and yeah, mostly retention and uh, scavenging phenomenon. And they have found over a long time that this, this, the lifetime of these substances are much higher than the primary aerosols. And but all of this, most of these models, they have uh, this, they say that there's a high uncertainty that arises because we do not have enough data for retention coefficients that are that are experimentally uh, derived. Uh, there are some uh, retention data coefficient data that are derived from for inorganic substances, but not much for organics. Yeah, so. So the most common water soluble organics are found are the carboxylic acids that have the CWOH group and the aldehydes, C double bond with oxygen and single bond with hydrogen. And this study was done by Alex, uh, Alex Yost. He's also uh, one of our colleague in Mainz University. He did a detailed study of the retention of organics as well as inorganics, uh, mostly organics in the wind tunnel. And yeah, he gave a very detailed analysis of the substances here. And I would also be using this reference quite often for our study. Now talking this few words about the carboxylic acids. So there, there have been uh, measurements all over the world in many places and in different different topography and locations, and they found the presence of carboxylic acid in rain, water, snow samples, in even polar ice. I think this was done by Sepmer and Kawamura. And on the most the most abundant of those carboxylic acids that are found in the atmosphere are formic acid, acetic acid, oxalic acid, malonic acid, and succinic acid. And also, these carboxylic acids, they have a very low photochemical reactivity. That is, they do not get uh, broken down easily from the UV rays from the atmosphere. So their lifetime is much more longer than the other organics. And then we have the aldehyde groups. So they are mostly released from, the sources are mostly from anthropogenic activities. and also, they're very photochemically active. They get easily broken down because of this double bond with the CO here. And the most abundant of those are formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and propanaldehyde. And formaldehyde is very volatile substance, which often reacts with the OH, uh, OH uh, radicals in the atmosphere. And they often lead to the formation of, yeah, formation of formic acid and also depletion of the OH layer in the atmosphere. Now we come back to this nice cartoon again. So here again, we have this within arrows where the aft drops and entrainment zone is around here somewhere. And then there could be this solutes with water droplets with arrows. Uh, so water soluble compounds, they could be scavenged in the aquasphere, or they could undergo rhyming and then get uplifted to the top of the atmosphere. And then they, there is a detrainment zone in here where they're expelled from this convective system. 
or they can also be scavenged again in the form of rain. Want to study the role of rhyming in this whole range, but yeah, as I showed earlier, we only have our experimental data up to this limit. In so what I said earlier, the retention coefficient is the amount of trace gases found in the rhyme hydrometeor divided by the initial concentration of the trace gases in supercool drops. So this is basically a division factor. So when we say the retention is one, that means the gas or the substance is completely retained in the ice phase when they're when they're frozen. And when the retention is zero, we say that the gas is gas totally escapes from the water droplet. There are there is a single drop freezing model that was uh, developed by Emily Stewart, and they quantified this retention phenomenon uh, in a one D model with some phase transition equations, which we use to also quantify our uh, experimental measurements. So again, here we see that the solutes they can be expelled. So there is a in the model, there is this expulsion time, tau xp, and then there could be some aqueous reactions happening inside the droplet of the solute. Then there is there could be aqueous diffusivity, where A is the droplet radius and dAQ is the diffusivity of uh, the diffusivity of the substance in aqueous solution. And then there is mass uh, mass transfer. There, alpha is the mass accommodation coefficient, and here H is the effective Henry's law that I mentioned earlier, and V is the thermal velocity. Yeah, average thermal thermal velocity in air. And we also have this gaseous diffusion. And you can see it during the freezing process. Now this time is calculated for the droplet size that we measured. Uh, that that was the average size distribution of our drops, which was more about 20 micrometers, and it took about yeah two and a half seconds and uh, two milliseconds. And this was calculated from the adiabatic and diabetic cooling rate, which I will come to in a while. And then the Stewart and Jacobson they developed this model. Uh, they developed this retention indicator as a ratio of the expulsion time by freezing time. So if the expulsion time is more, then the retention is higher, and if the freezing time is lower, the retention is less. So what they did is initially they did, they did not include in their 2003 paper, they did not include the aqueous uh, reactions happening inside. So they derived this, the other equation, and here. So here is a, I'm not sure if this is visible properly, but there is the effective Henry's law, Henry's law constant here, and this is the retention indicator. So for substances that are that have high effective Henry's law constant, they are found to have high retention indicator, or yeah, and they are, these substances are more dependent on the chemical properties of the solute. However, for substances with low Henry's effective Henry's law constant, they are more dependent on the physical properties, such as the temperature of the supercooled droplets or the liquid water content in the environment, droplet size, and also the ventilation around the rime collector or the droplets. So we also try to uh, keep it uh, very, uh, we try to uh, document it properly when we take uh, our measurements so that we can have a good, good data set that we can represent in the model and further have a, a nice uh, representation of the retention phenomenon. Now this was, this plot was taken from uh, Alex's paper in 2017. So here, if you see in this uh, right-hand side, we have the retention coefficient. On the left-hand side, we have this retention indicator. And this is just to show that uh, the substance that has a higher or lower retention indicator, they, are, they have lower retention. 
and for substances that are substances that are in the middle of this uh, not very high value of attention indicator they have they are in between 1 and 0 0.3 so we try to analyze uh, substances that can fit in this curve this whole range of uh, of uh, this scale here and then once so these are the substances that uh, that were analyzed in the wind tunnel and here we see we can get a very nice sigmoid, uh, sigmoidal fit here with this data. And so the, if, if you see here, the more of the stronger acids, the uh, oxalic acid, nitric acid, they are all retained during the freezing stage. However, for acidic acid, they are not much retained. And here we also have sulfur dioxide, although it is the same symbol, but uh, this is to show that uh, the measurements were done at different temperatures. So we have different Henry, Henry's law constant, and so there are different values of tension indicator. And the error bars are the measurement error that we get in the whole range of uh, analysis. This plot is very similar to when we try to relate the retention coefficient with effective Henry's law constant. The same plot, we also get a sigmoidal function if we use effective Henry's law for each substance at those at that particular temperature freezing. Here also we see that uh, acidic acid and the higher stronger acid, nitric acid and all, they have very high retention factor. So now we come, this was the overview of what was done before in the lab and what has been studied and why we are studying this. Now we come to the experimental section. So here we have this vertical wind tunnel. Uh, this is the observation section and this is Miklos. So he is the in charge of our tunnel, uh, the lab now, and also my supervisor. Uh, so this is just the observation section here and the cooling section, the flow section is in the horizontal part, it is basically a two-story two story, uh, facility. Here we study mostly wet and dry growth conditions. So by wet and dry growth, we mean that uh, the liquid water content is varied. You know, so for one sample, the, the liquid water content will be less, and for the others, it will be higher. And we studied a lot of single components that I have mentioned earlier, those alpha pinene derivatives and nitrophenols. And also, we studied some complex mixtures of nitrophenol mixtures. And also recently, currently we are doing some studies of extract from filter samples from Beijing. And this is done by Constantine and Alex Vogel's group in Frankfurt University. And yeah, in, they're also involved in our same project. And then we have another setup that is the caustic levitator. So, this is a very simple uh, setup that we use to levitate water droplets. Here is a source of an ultrasonic wave and it hits a reflector and we can suspend water drops yeah, at the nodes of those standing wave. And here as well, we observe the freezing mechanism here. And the freezing here is initiated by the, uh, with the help of an INP. Uh, right now I'm using silver iodide as the ice nucleating particle here. And here we also studied the Patrick. Okay. Okay. So we also observe the single components and currently we're also studying some binary mixtures such as uh, the mixtures of weak and strong acid or mixtures or in the coming Coming year, we also want to study mixtures of carboxylic acids and aldehydes and see how they react during the freezing process. And also we did some samples on the filter samples also that were uh, studied in the wind tunnel. They were also studied here. Uh, one major difference that we that is here is the drop size. So the wind tunnel, we have a sprayer system that sprays a stream of droplets. 
Here, drop size is about 20 micrometers average mean size. But here we are studying bigger drops and we try to achieve two millimeter size drops and also to have a good idea of the size dependency of the phenomenon of retention. Now coming to the design of the wind tunnel, it looks a bit complicated and some of the, uh, the writing is in German, but I can walk you through it. So this is a schematic of the our lab. This is the upper level and this is the lower level. And here is the cooling unit. There's a compressor here with coolant. And then here's a dryer section. So the cooling, the first we have to set up the cooling unit before we do the experiment, let it cool down for one hour, yeah, about one hour. And then we turn on the water systems to yeah, the pump to create the airflow. And the airflow from here, we, this is the half cooler, this is the main cooling section. And there was also a second cooling unit, which now is not very functional because of the age of the tunnel which is sad now, but still it's good to have the whole thing running. And this is the horizontal section and this the airflow from here goes to this vertical section. So what we saw in the picture earlier was this section here. And we also have some filters, some uh, uh, honeycombs to make to uh, maintain the flow laminar or turbulent conditions. And here is the controlling unit with the vacuum pumps. So this section is the whole of the cooling unit. And this is the airstream modification. By airstream modification, we mean that there we have a valve here that we can manipulate, uh, that we can open and close to manipulate the wind speed inside the tunnel. And then this is the controlling unit, basically to maintain the airflow. So if we need a higher wind speed, we have to use the, both the pumps and for small, smaller wind speed we use, we can do with single pump. So it's just a quick history about the tunnel. So it was built by Mr. Prupaka and Mr. Mitra. They were, they were in UCLA before and they also had this vertical tunnel. And, but for some reason, they stopped, the, the funding got stopped, or yeah, something happened, and they, Mr. Prabhakar managed to get some funding from the German Research Foundation, and both of them came from UCLA, and then they built a tunnel, and Mr. Mitra is still with us uh, in the tunnel as a uh, consultant, and he is the soul of the tunnel. If something happens, he's the guy we go to, and yeah, he knows all the tricks and bits of the tunnel. So the construction was in 1985, and then the first experiments <coughs> were done in 1987, and they were mostly about uh, acid rain and their uh, scavenging efficiency in the atmosphere, because back then it was a hot topic and funds were available for that. And then in the early 2000, the lab was uh, Mr. Uh, Stefan Borman. He was in charge of the lab and then we focus on more on the ice cloud section of the atmosphere. Just to have a overview. So this is the schematic here, and this is the what it actually looks like. Hmm. We can also change the cross section area to have a yeah vary the different wind speed as well as uh, uh, as part of the requirements of our. Uh, experiments. So we have different cross section. The maximum wind speed, we can go up to 40 meters per second. And the ad adaptation time to wind speed, the valve adaptation time. And then this is the maximum flow that can be passed through the tunnel. And temperatures, uh, minus 25. Nowadays, with the second cooler not functioning properly, we do not really get minus 25, but slightly warmer than that. And yeah, but we do not all, but do not, we do not have a pressure control in the tunnel. And the hydrometeor that we studied here were mostly cloud droplets, snowflakes, ice particles, grapple, and then there were some 3D printed hail that were studied. Also, uh, the ventilation and melting were studied here. 
not sure there was something else here, but anyway. <clears throat> so, excuse me. And this is the observations chamber section, and this is specific to our measurements, what, how we take our measurements in the, in the tunnel. So we have a uh, sampling chamber, we call it, in this section here. And this has a liquid nitrogen finger. This is basically a Teflon tube, just a test tube, and we put uh, liquid nitrogen through it to maintain it a, to maintain the temperature of that of this finger at minus 70 to minus 80. And we have uh, Teflon rods here, and also a hydrometeor. Now we are using Grapple, about two millimeter in size. And as I mentioned earlier, this the airflow airstream comes out, and then we have the sprayer system, and they <clears throat> spray a jet of uh, substances mixed in the aqueous phase, and they are uplifted here in this section. And then we also have the PT hundred the temperature sensor here, and yes, and also so for our measurements. What I said earlier was that we take the difference in the concentration in the ice phase and the liquid phase. It is very simple, but in really in reality, this is also simple, but we take the we measure the retention coefficient in this setup by taking the concentration of the sample and the tracer <clears throat> from the grapple. Well. So for example, if we are, if we are, if when we test uh, one component, for example, we are testing two nitrophenol, we will we are using sodium bromide as a tracer, and tracer is a substance that has a known retention value of one. So we know that whatever is retained in uh, everything of it is, of it is retained in the ice phase. And we use this liquid nitrogen finger as a reference. So in at minus seventy, minus eighty, uh, it is. Uh, assumed or it is, it is also known we have tested it. Uh, we have also tested it in the quantitative analysis that at this temperature everything is retained. So we use the liquid phase concentration from here that is collected in this grapple and the sample obtained from, from the liquid nitrogen finger. Substance that this is Okay. So, uh, these are the alpha pinene derivatives that we studied: pinandiol, pinonic acid, pinic acid, and also nitrophenol groups, nitrophenol and a mixture of nitrophenols, four nitrophenol, and also complex mixture. These are ongoing studies. And yeah, as I mentioned, the liquid nitrogen finger is maintained so that everything is retained here. And the tracer we, are, we have used in all these measurements is sodium bromide. And as I mentioned earlier, the wet growth here in the weight growth, we try to keep it at a warmer temperature and high liquid water content. And for dry growth, we used to we keep it at a try to go for a lower temperature and less liquid water content. The basic difference is the rhyme collector. So this is a image of the weight growth that is seen inside the sampler. So in weight growth, the uh, ice that is collected in those samples, those are they have a high density compared to the compared to the um, from the dry growth, they have a less density of ice. Here, so this Teflon bar is the same here, the gray thing. The liquid nitrogen finger is not visible in this image. And this bar is just a stand for the sampler. This is we, we don't take measurement from this. And here, the small tiny dot that is not focused properly is the grapple that 
that collects the uh, substance while fizzing. And the drop size yeah, distribution, as I said earlier, is about 21.5 plus 8.5 mean, yeah, mean diameter in number concentration. And we also look at the other setup. So as I said, we use two setups. One is the wind tunnel and one is the acoustic levitator. <clears throat> I'll quickly talk about the acoustic levitator setup here. And this is a schematic of the setup. So here we have this levitator from the top view. And here is a pyrometer where we can this basically uh, senses or measures the surface temperature of the drop. And we have a <coughs> camera setup that can that give us the information on the size of the drops. And yeah, this is just a sliding rail. It looks like this. We can adjust the height and and the distance from the drop. And this is the pyrometer which and this crisscross we have to keep it heated. We do these experiments in the cold room at minus 15, minus 20, also minus 25. Earlier we could go to minus 30, but nowadays since yeah, the compressors are getting older, we do not get that much. So we are happy with minus 28 or so. The main uh, concept of this levitator is that there is an ultrasonic wave of 58 kilohertz that is generated by a function generator. And it is fed to this, this section in here. This is the source. And we have a metal plate at the top of the, in front of the source. So the incident wave is reflected back. And then we get a standing wave. And in those nodes here, we can levitate these drops. And we can also uh, manipulate or adjust the drop size uh, by increasing or decreasing the field of the ultrasonic wave. Uh, not feel the strength. However, uh, for levitating droplets, we also have the wind tunnel set up in here. But for our experiments, for our current measurements, we are using this levitator. But just to give a comparison of both the setups that we have here, so we go, we can get to more or less the same range, but not much warmer in this range in the levitator. And freezing mode is mostly immersion freezing. Contact freezing, people they tried uh, some years ago, but it was not very successful. So yeah, sometimes we also try for that, but right now we are mostly using this setup. And then the cooling is continuous cooling here. They have isothermal cooling <laughs> around the tunnel. Uh, the main advantage of using this one, this setup is that we have we can directly measure the surface temperature of the droplet. But for the tunnel, to measure the temperature of the levitated drop, we have to, uh, we have to calculate the size, the uh, temperature of the environment, that's the infinity and the dew point temperature, and then we can have a relation or we can obtain a parameterization or of the drop size, uh, drop surface temperature. And here there is no airflow. Here we need the airflow. So it is more energy efficient here. And also we get, uh, you know, we are right now studying, uh, investigating two millimeter size drops. And this is the volume of, average volume of those drop size. And this is just the number of drops that we measure. Depends on the, if we have a good day in the lab, we can go up to 100 drops, we can collect 100 drops. If not, we have to be satisfied with 20, 30 drops sometimes. So how the drop freezes. So here is a very nice schematic here. We inject the drop that is at a warmer temperature initially, and then it goes, undergoes gradual cooling and it reaches super cooling state. Then at this point, there is onset of freezing and then there is adiabatic freezing here. So the, the temperature reaches to, ideally it, reach, it should reach to exactly zero. Uh, because then the drop is in a mixture of solute and uh, ice and liquid phase. And then after the drop is frozen, it starts cooling down again to the ambient temperature. So here is the freezing onset. Uh, so now this is how the drops look. 
initially they are more or less spherical then this is stage number two here they are in the ice and liquid phase where they go rapid cooling and freezing and then once they are frozen they get this round shape so this shape is mostly due to the field of the ultrasonic wave so the wave structure of the drop if there was no field then the drop could have expanded in any way but since there is a field to limit the drop we have this one and this is how the actual data from the pyrometer looks like so we have we get this very nice super cooling instead of freezing and gradually goes down and we also get slightly warmer temperature because the pyrometer it also it, it basically measures the infrared wave coming from the surface so there's also some re reflection from the housing of the acoustic trap and we get some bit of yeah uh, other biases but which is not that much and here we have a small video of a drop this one there's a play button here can you press the no no back yeah so you can see how the drop is freezing if you have a look at the temperature here it's very rapid notice so it starts cooling from a warmer temperature it goes down gradually and instantly it goes up to the equilibrium phase and then it starts cooling down again here pt100 is the temperature inside the housing of the acoustic uh, levitator and this ambient temperature is not the room temperature this is the temperature of the pyrometer so the pyrometer also needs to have a uh, needs to be kept warm from the heating pad so that there is no measurement biases coming from the pyrometer so yes now what so we're done with our experimental setup now we go to the analysis what we do so for the wind tunnel measurements we prepare a solution of 10 liters in uh, this 10 liter flask then we feed that system into a sprayer spraying unit uh, for, first of all we flush the lines for one hour half an hour so that there is no contamination from previous measurements or something and this is done in the lower section of the wind tunnel that I, sh that I showed earlier. And those samples, after they are, after those solution is passed through the wind tunnel, they get uh, rhyming happens and then they get frozen and we get some ice on those Teflon tabs on the grapple. And then we preserve them in the coal, in the freezer. And then later on, we melt them, filter them for analysis in the uh, orbit up. So this is a, ultra high precision liquid crystallography unit and high resolution mass spectrometry uh, mass spectrometer i'll come to that shortly however in the acoustic trap we since we have single drops we take a spoon once it is frozen we collect the drop take a while collect it so we collect 10 drops uh, one drop is roughly about 4 microliters and it depends on the detection capability of the instrument we need more some sometimes uh, we need at least 200 microliters so we collect 10 drops and we dilute it further 10 times so that we get that little, uh, required amount and then we do the quantitative analysis in the ion chromatography unit for yeah for the ionic solvents and also for the organic solvents we use hplc that is high precision liquid crystallography unit so a quick uh, overview of it in the ion chromatography basically we have uh, they are separated by their ionic charges in the solvent there is a column unit there is a small column and there is a that is called the mobile phase and when the solution is injected into the column it passes through the mobile phase and based on their ionic charges of the solvent they are uh, they are detected in that uh, yeah in the chamber and then we get a nice chromatograph and from that we can get the concentration and we can calculate the retention coefficients same goes for crystal uh, hplc machine uh, instrument here the main detection is based on the polarity for organic solvents they are not in ionic phases so we cannot detect those organic solvents in ion chromatography that well 
So we use this instrument where we can uh, increase or decrease the polarity of the solution, and then we can change their uh, change their, uh, retention time in the chromatograph. And we also have a ultra high performance liquid crystallography and high resolution mass spectrometry. This is not, uh, this unit is in the chemistry department of Mainz University and also in Frankfurt. And this is a very nice instrument. It, 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 it needs just 10 microliters of sample and, and the mass spectrometer is a very helpful unit to pinpoint what component it is. Here we have to, in this HPLC and IC, we have to have a um, higher concentration of so our substance to for it to be detected in the system, but in the orbitrap or in this instrument, it can detect very low. Yeah, it can go. The resolution is very high. And there is a mass spectrometer that detects the you know, mass to charge that has a mass to charge ratio detector, and we can get the we can pinpoint our substance with how much it is. And now we come to our results. So first of all, I said we use the silver iodide for our measurements as a as an INP. Now what we do is we characterize the INP first. And how we do that, we collect about 40, 60 drops and at different different temperatures and at different different concentrations. So the freezing is dependent on the concentration of the INP inside the so in the solvent. So if we put a, a lot of solvent, the freezing will be faster, or if we put a lot of yeah, less amount of INP, the freezing will be much slower. And here we designed uh, three, yeah, at three temperature we did this, and we found, so this is at uh, 0 0.2 grams per liter, this is at 0 0.01 grams per liter, and this is 0 0.0003 grams per liter. And then we get uh, a term that we call it as frozen fraction, or F ice. So it basically the, uh, indicates the total fraction of drops that are frozen at a particular temperatures with an error bar of 0 0.5 Kelvin. Uh, this, the, this arises from the fact that when we take our measurements from the pyrometer, we divide the temperature. So we all the drops do not freeze at the same temperature. They have different, different freezing time or temperatures. So we take the whole data set and we divide into beams of 0 0.5 Kelvin range. And then we have a size distribution like this. And from this size distribution of frozen fraction, we get uh, number density, or basically this is the number of active sites that are present in the droplet. And yeah, so we get a nice distribution of at different temperatures. And the number density can also be uh, calculated. The references are not seen here. Anyway, uh, so it is, based, uh, it is a logarithm of the Fi's by the area, and the area is calculated by the drop volume, concentration, and specific surface area of the INP. Uh, this unit is not. It is uh, given by the manufacturer. They have a way of measuring the specific surface area, and then we calculate this value. And then we get this NS is the number, yeah, density here. And in simple terms, we can just say these are active ice nucleating sites. Did all these things, just this is nice. We come to this plot again. Here we have the our recent results. <clears throat> so the gray dots that we see here are the results that were done earlier that I showed in the other plot. The green ones are done with the wind tunnel measurements with the nitrophenol and uh, alpha pinene derivatives. And this blue and red dots are the measurements from the acoustic trap. Earlier, we did not study bigger drops with the acoustic trap. So we are doing this currently. This is Part of my main project now here. Also, I'm involved in this one as well, but mostly I'm doing this section. And we try to plot our results, or all the results in the same plot. And we see that the same for substances with higher 
uh, Heinrich's law constant, the retention is mostly one. However, if we see these two squares here, they are from formic acid. So the wind tunnel measurements, they have a lower value because of the, they have a lower drop size. But as we go higher with a bigger drops, we get a higher retention of that. In simple terms, as the size increases, it is it becomes a bit difficult for them to be expelled into the gaseous phase and they remain inside their frozen hydrometeor. Same goes for acetic acid and also for nitrophenol. Uh, we see a really big difference here. And we also did some initial tests on binary mixtures. Uh, we did a mixture of acetic acid and nitric acid here. And the, the measurements are within the error range. So we cannot really say if the mixture is affecting the retention of these components. However, for formic acid, the error bar is very low. It's, it was 0 0.01. Yeah. So we do see a slight increase in the retention of formic acid in the binary mixture. And this is our this initial results. So the takeaway points from this plot is, yeah, as I mentioned, the color, the new data, they saw they have similar dependency with the effective Henry's law constant. And as I mentioned, there is a drop size dependency with the wind tunnel measurements in the gray and the green dots. They have a size distribution of 21 micrometer, and this is a bigger drop. And yeah. They, the, the binary mixture they so show relatively higher, but yeah, this is still ongoing measurements. So I use the word relatively. And then this also has a better agreement with the retention indicator plot, but this is not shown in here. So a few slides on the dependency of pH and temperature. Of the this, these are the alpha pine in derivatives, and this was mostly done by Christina Bochers from the chemistry department in uh, Mainz University. So here we see the they did with pH seven and pH four at different temperatures of wet growth and dry growth regimes, and for pinonic acid we do not see much of a difference or much of a dependency. Same goes for pinic acid; they are more or less scattered around the same uh, area. And however, for Pinandiol, we, the average of this, we can see uh, some, some dependency on the pH, but not very distinct or significant. Yeah, this is pos possible. Yeah, there could be, uh, Pinandiol has possible pH dependencies. And then same goes for nitrophenol mixtures. And this was all. This is also headed. The lead researcher was Christina Bockers, and we were all involved in the measurements. And here also, this is a plot for nitrobenzoic acid and nitrophenols. We do not see any dependency on either temperature or uh, pH. For nitrophenol, not really. But there is an interesting also observation. Like if you see, there's two nitrophenol and four nitrophenol. Two nitrophenols they have retention about 0.14 on average. Our four nitrophenol is more close to one. So this just the attachment of this OH ring and this benzene ring it changes the retention of the whole compound. Then we also did for methyl nitrophenol and nitrocatechol. So these nitro compounds were done uh, as a nitrophenol mixture, except for nitro two nitrophenol. And yes, as we see, no significant dependencies. And last slide for here from, from the results section is that we have, now we also measured the pH dependency from the acoustic trap measurements. And we, these are for the single components only, the binary components are not done yet. We are, we are ongoing. And we, for nitrophenol, we do not see much of a pH dependency here. For us, uh, in the atmosphere, this pH change is more relevant, 3.5 to 5. Others are not relevant, but still we, since we want to know their dependency and how it changes, we do this. We get the whole set of data. Uh, 
for formic acid, for acidic acid, they're in the error, the range of the error bar, so we cannot really say if it has a different density. For formic acid, it's very less, not for nitrophenol as well. However, we do see some temperature dependency for nitrophenol in here. The formic acid is more or less the same within the error, bar, error range. Acidic acid also, it has a big error range and we can't be really we, we can't really be sure. However, for nitrophenol, in the smaller drops, we did not see any dependency on temperature, but for the bigger drops, now we do see a dependency and this we have to investigate this a bit further. And the takeaway points here from this results is that the pH dependency we yeah, have seen for formic acid, yeah, slightly and acidic acid and also possible temperature dependency for nitrophenol. And yeah, for acidic acid, it is very close to the error detection. And we come to our summary. So the highly soluble substances, this they show a retention close to one and the volatile substances that they have a low retention values. And from our measurements and we can estimate the retention coefficient very well by relating it to effective Henry's law coefficient, the uh, effective uh, Henry's law constant. And then we also see the size dependency of the retention coefficients. They, not, uh, not the highly soluble substances such as nitric acid, they're more or less the same, but for the volatile substances such as the 2-nitrophenol, we do see a uh, size dependency. <coughs> In our measurements, largely drop, yeah, so in higher frequency, and then pH dependency also varies with the droplet size. And hopefully, in the coming months or year, we have more data set to be more precise about our observations. This is our outlook. We will be doing some more measurements with binary mixtures from, yeah, as I said earlier, acid aldehydes or different combinations and see how they affect the retention coefficients. And we also have to check for desorption because during the cooling, the solute can be either dissolved into from the liquid surface. And we do not, and that will definitely affect the retention coefficient. And we want to avoid that. So we also do some desorption measurements. I have not shown those here, but yeah, they are still ongoing. And then, this uh, this is our very latest measurements thin complex mixtures. We we call it complex from fil the filter sample. We call it complex mixtures mostly because we do not know what's in there before until unless we analyze, and that is also and for complex mixture we cannot really do quantitative analysis. We do more like a qualitative analysis of the group of substances that we find, for example, nitro groups or phenol groups in other substances, and yeah. We also have uh, to develop the model, uh, the drop freezing model. We have a setup that we use the high-speed camera. We levitate the drop, and we want to see the initiation of freezing and how the shell formation takes place because the model depends on the freezing time and the explosive time, and it, it changes for size. And we want to have a better understanding of that process as well. In our facility, we have a high-speed camera of that can go up to 2,000 frames per second, but again, with more frames, the data is limited. So, it, so we'll yeah, we have to work on this one, and hopefully, we get some good videos and freezing profiles. And this is our whole working group. I did not show this earlier to confuse people. It's a lot of people here. So, me, Christina Bokers from Chemistry Department, then Jackson he is in our lab. Constantin is with the Goethe University, Frankfurt, and there are two bachelor students, master students, who also work as student assistants here. Then there's Alex, Alex Vogel, Alex Theis, also Mr. Hoffman, Mr. Mitra, Mr. Borman, and Miklos. And yeah, that is all I have for you. Am I out of time or? Thank you. Out of time for up for this nice talk and uh, I think we can have questions now. Thank you, uh, Gautam. 
Thanks for the excellent talk. I have uh, one question. Uh, how do you allow the uh, cloud to form? I mean, you inject the, um, say, trace element after formation of the uh, droplet, no, no. or you form it on the, uh, I mean, Solution. on that uh, particle itself? Yes, so uh, do you mean to say about the tracer? Yeah, tracer you inject after in the liquid form, or I mean, when your droplets yeah, yeah. form already, or you allow them to grow on that trace element? No, no, no. So when when we prepare our stock solution that we put in the sprayers, we we put our substance and the tracer together. Okay, then you spray. Yeah, then then there is a sprayer system that uh, lets out a jet stream through the tunnel, and that is carried, carried by the airstream and uploaded to the vertical section. Okay, that so means that already you have liquid formed, and yeah. then you allow. And then we externally mix the uh, elements. Yes, so that so the whole idea is that in clouds, the, they 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 will always they will already be in the liquid phase, aqueous phase. Those are water soluble substances that we are studying. Okay. So we already make an aqueous solution. We add our tracer so that we can analyze them, uh, so that we know that this is not our element. In the when we do our quantitative analysis, okay. then we let it run and yeah, yeah. take our mission. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and uh, yeah. Maybe you tell your name and then. That's good. Okay, uh, very nice talk, Gautam. Is that really very vast? You have you are talking from. I think if I remember correctly, I can make a two part. One is the uh, what you are talking about the retention, and another is the the freezing of uh, droplet freezing freezing basically agi what you are talking okay in the far, from the first part you are talking about the retention retention coefficient so actually i am a little bit curious and trying to understand that how the retention coefficient is going to the uh, ice freezing because if i understood the cooler theory so the hysteresis can be taken care and uh, by modifying the cooler car, incorporating the hydrophobicity. So similarly, is there any way you are doing or you are trying to understand the, because I don't find any formulation, so mathematical relationship. How do we take into account the retention coefficient in your uh, ice freezing or, or uh, ice freezing? The toxic nucleation theory is not being a retention coefficient in the ice freezing. So how you can take care? This is the first question. Okay, second question that you are not considering the deposition because this is not the dry particle. This is the opaque particle what you are injecting. So the AG uh, uh, experiment, so there is the number density you are calculating with a function of temperature. Do you feel that uh, that uh, the nucleation rate is the only function of temperature? It must be the supersaturation also. Yes. So how the wind tunnel taking care of the supersaturation? That things. Okay. Thank you. This is my two questions. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, for uh, I will go from the back uh, from the question number two. <laughs> so firstly, uh, what you said about the number density. Uh, if I understood it correctly, uh, did you mean to say that it is uh, not dependent on the temperature or super, yeah. Uh, here, the super saturation, yes, it is of course dependent, but uh, in the, we, we, we use the INP in the acoustic trap measurements for single droplets in our current study. And there, the environment ambient is cool enough, so when the, drop is levitated, it gets super cool, super cooling. If you uh, see that curve here, okay, yeah, here. So it, the, the nucleation happen, happens because of the presence of the INP and this number density here. Yeah, and this is mostly, this is basically the active size from uh, the concentration or the uh, the binding efficiency of the INP that is spread across the whole droplet. So here, yes, uh, in the coastal trap, we do not have uh, liquid water 
uh, content manipulation. It is mostly dry. It is yeah undersaturated, but uh, that that's the whole reason we use the INPs to make make them freeze. And the first question uh, about retention coefficient. So here we we relate the retention coefficient with effective Henry's law. If you remember, see the plot here. Uh, 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 here, so uh, according to Henry's law, that uh, I said earlier that the temperature and pressure at the fixed temperature and pressure, the pressure of the partial pressure of the gas inside the liquid, uh, the concentration of gas inside a liquid or the solvent inside a liquid will be the same as the partial pressure outside the environment or the drop. And that I think takes care of the retention or the quantification that we are doing in here. So basically, when we relate it to the ambient temperature and this Henry's law, effective Henry's law is also temperature dependent. So the, the values that you see here, these values, if there are some experimental studies that people have, uh, there is a nice database where they give uh, the people upload or yeah, upload their data on the effective Henry's law for different different organics and inorganics and at different temperatures. And there are also some models Small online models the way where, where we can use the models and then we can predict the Henry's law coefficient at different specific temperature and pressure. And I think that, or I, we believe in our experiments and studies uh, in our research that this is a good enough, it's a well fit for the quantification that we are using because we are just checking the concentration that was in liquid phase before freezing and after freezing. And we quantifying this retention as the concentration retention coefficient as the amount that has been retained in this process, two processes. That, that's true, that's fine. Mm -hmm. My question is that uh, how uh, this retention coefficient as a modeler, suppose, mm -hmm. so how this retention coefficient is going to the calculation of the freezing? Because so, uh, if you give either in the Brownian forces or phoretic forces, then we can understand that the particle uh, will collide with the droplets, a cloud or rain, and then into the fridge. Otherwise, you have to put in some kernel so that the, the nutrition from the formulation so we keep the diffusion co I mean, uh, your retention coefficient, similar to the uh, diffusion coefficient. So in the condensation coefficient, you can put. So if in the equation, this is a coefficient. So my point is that the retention coefficient, whether it will come through the phoretic process or the process, or something else, it is coming into the freezing, the formulation of the freezing. That's it. Uh, okay, now I get it correct. So it is basically coming from the formulation of the freezing that the, the Amy Stewart and Jack, uh, Jacobson, yeah, this formulation. So they quantify this phenomenon as a retention indicator. Oh, this is a so this is an indicator only. Okay, no, no, no. Uh, uh, okay, so that's right. This fine. is an indicator, okay. and we showed the relation here. Uh, one moment. Yeah. Here. So here we. Uh, we had we we get a sigmoidal fit for the retention indicator and the coefficient. This is from the model prediction what they do and their calculation, and this is what we do in our uh, what how we relate our retention to effective Henry's law. Okay. And that's and from here they go to the model. Yeah, it's just an indicator here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Gautam. Um, so in the retention coefficient, uh, the curve, uh, I see most of them are like uh, anthropogenic uh, SOA. So any uh, biogenic SOA other than pinic acid, uh, pinin. Um, so no other uh, uh, biogenic uh, SOA comes into... Uh, uh, not yet. Uh, one difficulty is to find this 
uh, these values for these components. So when we try to relate with the indicator and also the Henry's law coefficient, we need this mass accommodation coefficient and the diffusivity. And since these are all a huge group of uh, finding derivatives, we do not have those data readily available. There are some models uh, like small yeah, numerical models online, API, AP model that predicts this. Uh, you can predict this Henry's law and yeah, mass accommodation sometimes, but okay. You don't really also, you mentioned that the highly volatile uh, uh, components will have less retention yes. coefficient, and the low volatile have a high retention yes. coefficient. So that's what we found in our okay. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, I have a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, one is uh, you found that uh, in when you are doing the experiments with large drops, so your uh, retention coefficient is way off from the yeah. curve. Um, uh, but we, how do you physically explain that? Because uh, we, no longer that is following the curve that you have yes, fitted. Yeah. The models, maybe that curve is from the model, or it's mm. not a theoretical curve, right? Uh, the curve, the, the recent results, the curve is from. Yeah, for small, from, uh, small uh, drops, you mentioned that it is. Uh, yeah, it's lower. Uh, yeah, it's lower. It, it is coming close to the. That's what's uh, so falling on the. Yes, uh, yeah. exactly. We also uh, had this. Uh, Discussion with Alex and Mr. Mitra before. So basically, what uh, we hypo we think or we have a hypothesis that with the cooling of the droplets, because they go very fast cooling, and then the the super cooling stage here is lower for this bigger droplet. Bigger droplet. It takes a longer time to cool. Okay. And probably we think that the because of the size of the droplet, the diffusivity of the comp uh, substance also affect that how much, if, how much so if the diffusivity and the mass accommodation coefficients are higher uh, or lower they cannot easily ex be expelled from the uh, binding forces of the droplet okay okay and also there is also that is also one aspect that we are we will be investigating now and also, the freezing profile that I mentioned at the end, we want to study the freezing profile of a single drop. Uh, if the freezing has, uh, if the initiation is not, um, if the initiation of the freezing happens randomly and then there is a crack propagation of freezing like those dendritic uh, projections, then we don't really know yeah, which way the drop will freeze. But if there's a shell formation, then for a bigger droplet, if, the, if there's a shell formation, then the it will be difficult for those solute to break away from the shell. Yeah, actually, you were looking at uh, and before the free, uh, the breakup, right? Yeah, yeah. Freezing before the breakup, yes, and uh, even that specule type, uh, even the example you have shown, there is a small specule type forming. In uh, the... This because of the ultrasonic. Field. Ultra oh, okay. That has nothing to do with the ice. Okay, so they, okay. if they, when it freezes, ice they would expand in all yeah. directions. Okay. But since we have that ultrasonic wave that. OK. Uh, uh, here, so if the drop is here, so it is getting ventilation from the sides oh, okay. and it cannot expand in the horizontal direction. That is why okay. it is expanding in the long. So I was thinking that maybe it is uh, preferential uh, no, no. growth is there. This is just the experimental setup okay. how it is. Okay. OK, then one more question is uh, if um, uh, there are aerosol like a dust particle in, in and then there are the coating of some soluble material on the dust. Mm -hmm. So there are some studies which are uh, showing that the um, process, the uh, aqueous uh, chemistry can indeed remove the dust from these um, clouds and then um, I don't know whether your studies in your study, are you looking at any aerosol injection into the? Uh, uh, yes, I mean before earlier there there there, there had been studies with uh, mineral dust with Mine ice, yeah. and uh, Miklos he did uh, in his yeah, some of his papers he studied uh, then they use elite as the INP and also kalonite and uh, yeah yeah the kalonite also those mineral dust so. yes so they they did those studies and for elite. From the top of my head, if I remember, 
the elite is a well, yeah it, it was a good inp but feldspar or yeah it took a long time to freeze and so it again depends on the binding efficiency of the this particle in mm. with, with water mm. how how they i mean i'm not a chemist pure chemist to give you a proper explanation but this is what i what from the discussion i've had with my so the filters are indeed you take the particles into a liquid uh, media and then spray it into the yes exactly so the filters that uh, just the recent studies that uh, yeah constantin mm. and they are doing here uh, yeah so basically we take the filter we extract it in methanol and then we let it dry and we if we are lucky we get good amount of filter or deposition of substances and then we dilute those substances then we form a protocol to analyze them in the uh, in the instruments in the hplc or orbitrap and then depending on their level of detection we know how much we need to dilute it so for example if the mass loading is very nice we can dilute it to say 50 times of that mass and then we can put it in the sprayer systems but uh, Yes, of course. If the mass loading is less, then we cannot dilute it that much. Otherwise, we will not be able to have a proper proper detection. Then we are thinking we will mostly focus on the. If the mass is less, we'll focus on the acoustic trap because there we need hardly five ml of solution. Okay. So one drop is like four microliters. We collect about yeah hundred ten drops, and then that is. 400 microliters so that will be a mixture right yes, where sure. you will be using a mixture of uh, yeah, so there we will have only qualitative analysis yeah unless and until we know there is a specific aerosol or there is a specific uh, substance group that are already present we it's difficult to you don't do any semtem or any analysis no, uh, prior no. to your no no not that i'm aware of okay <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. And uh, is there any more questions? Yeah. What is the importance of that binary mixture? Ah, uh, yes, it's a. Uh, actually, uh, there is also we we wanted to investigate because uh, if you there was an um, in the equation. Is a uh, moment. Here, yeah, this term. So this term is for the chemical reaction taking place in the aqueous form. uh we do not really know what are the chemical reaction that are happening inside if they are uh, if they, if it is not only one single component for example in if you have seen in for a case of ammonia ammonia reacts with the atmospheric co2 and then although it has a lower henry's law coefficient it shows very high tension because it is already broken down into uh yeah ammonia ion and in the ionic form they could not they cannot uh, they cannot break the shell or the get out from the frozen state like semi frozen state to the um, outside so this is just our yeah investigation to see how a mixture of some components will affect the retention and uh yeah just to have a good uh, background data set for data that when we we one part of our project is to also when we have finally all the data set of the substances that we want to measure we want to develop this drop freezing model that was developed by Stuart and Jacobson and implement those results for that can be further incorporated into yeah chemistry couple models so that is the main thing yeah. any more we have this comments Okay. And there, I also have. If somebody wants to have a look at the recent studies that have been going on in the wind tunnel, I I don't think there are a lot of people are studying retention here or anywhere. It's uh, so here are some of the studies that are currently going on. If if you are interested, you can yeah take the references or contact the people and. Yeah. some of collision of hail drops and ventilation melting of propyl ventilation and also ice nucleation uh, mr hemsfield uh, of, comes to our lab 
Okay. He's, he's coming, I think, end of September. Um, also, there are uh, uh, numerical modeling groups, right, in yes. your in yeah. in your university, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. So that is okay. All okay. Have. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matranda. And in front of, uh, I think everybody had a wonderful time talk listening to you. And yeah. um, this is, uh, I think. This was first of its uh, kind talk here okay. on the lab. Okay. Uh, so we are very appreciative about your okay. Thank you very much for time and Thank you Thank for you. your kind patience and cooperation. Yeah, it's uh, you. You really uh, uh, yeah. initiated something new here. So yeah. maybe people will get interested in more lab studies. <laughs> so. yeah. Thank you.